Uh, hello, I'm Mario Guillén, a professor at the Wharton School, and today I am interviewing Marco De Benedetti, uh, who is speaking with us from Rome in Italy. He is the managing director and co-head of the Europe Biot Group at Carlisle. He's a former CEO of Telecom Italia. Uh, he's a Wharton alum. And uh, I have a very, very simple first question for you, uh, Marco, today, which is, what's the situation in Italy as we speak today on March 27th? Well, you think it's an easy question and a simple question. The uh, situation is, uh, is unclear, I would say. Uh, clearly, Italy was among the European country, uh, the first country to be hit uh, uh, seriously by the spread of the virus. Uh, I think now it's much more of a Europe-wide phenomenon, but probably Italy is uh, 10 days to two weeks uh, ahead of the curve. And I think it's actually an interesting uh, data point for a number of other countries. Uh, we have not seen the peak yet. Uh, the last couple of days have been starting to see some encouraging signals where the rate of growth of new infections has started to slow down. Uh, it is, however, apparent that uh, the number of infected person is significantly higher than the one reported, simply because the testing is not done on the entire population. And the official number talk about something like 80,000 infection. Uh, the best estimate is uh, north of a half a million. So it starts to be a, a large number of people uh, it has started in the north of Italy, uh, fairly concentrated initially in two areas, and it's now spreading pretty much throughout the country. Um, the mortality rate, which appeared to be uh, particularly high in Italy compared to what we had seen in Asia, in China, in South Korea, and in Japan, is uh, coming down simply because of the denominator. Um, and therefore, I don't think we have a mortality rate, which is much different than what we've seen in other countries. As you know, we have done a lockdown. We are basically in lockdown. It has been uh, a progressive mode, which is something that I believe most countries, especially in the Western world, um, almost have to do it. I think it's very hard overnight to impose uh, a total lockdown. So it has been progressive. Uh, it is now almost complete uh, in the sense that there are a few businesses which are still running, but uh, most of the economy is basically uh, in an idle mode. Um, it's been very tough on the population uh, because people are not just not used uh, to stay home. Uh, big concern clearly in terms of job security because uh, Clearly, all companies in shutdown mode uh, run very quickly into issues, uh, simple cash issues. And so on top of the health concern, you have the concern of uh, your job security, and, and that clearly doesn't help. Uh, the government of Italy has uh, put in place a number of measures, uh, as most other co countries have done. Um, I don't think there's any country that can support the entire economy for uh, you know, any long period. Uh, and therefore, the question in everybody's mind is, how long is it going to last? And uh, the second question that people are asking is, uh, is it worth it? Uh, because the second level of concern is, okay, we're going through this... Uh, period of pain, but when we reopen, what guarantee do we have that the virus doesn't start spreading again? And therefore, you know, one of the question is, is this pain, which is substantial, is it worth it? I mean, that I think is a question that uh, people have in their mind. Uh, the various authorities are not giving a clear path, not because they don't want to, but simply because it's all so new that it is honestly hard to make any, any hard prediction. My personal feel, but uh, this is only based on a couple of discussion I have had, I don't think there is anything decided, is that we will see a gradual 
uh, reopening and is going to be a fairly long period characterized by opening, closing, opening, closing, maybe at a regional level, maybe in some sectors, maybe by age group. This is something, for example, in Israel, they're, they're, they're thinking about whereby the older people are more protected and a bit less restrictive uh, on younger people. So I do believe that it's not going to be a black and white, I uh, you know today we're closed, tomorrow we'll be open. I think we'll have to be, to get used to a, a fairly long period of, you know, up and down, on, off type of things. Uh, that is what uh, I think is the case. Clearly, one huge impact has been on the uh, hospital system and the healthcare uh, system overall, and clearly the effort to buy time so that you can pump up uh, the capacity of the hospital, especially with what concerns intensive care. Um, and I have to say uh, that it worked you know, fairly well. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we have all of the hospital beds that are required, but uh, in a very short period of time, you have seen a very significant increase by you know, putting in, in uh, on the ground the military, uh, uh, seizing hotels, I mean, a number of different measures and that it was important to gain time because clearly you need to be in a position to treat people. But uh, uh, the strain on the, uh, on the healthcare system has been quite severe, and I do believe that most countries will see that because clearly no healthcare system was prepared just in terms of sheer volume to manage that. Uh, an additional issue that is uh, becoming quite apparent is that hospitals are among the worst places to be. And therefore, uh, you start to see a number of doctors that are getting ill. And uh, the big issue in terms of what I call the capacity is the physical beds, is the equipment, the ventilators, and all of that. But more importantly, is the trained personnel and the trained medical personnel. And if on top of it they get ill, uh, that really creates it in even... A bigger strain on the uh, on the infrastructure. So uh, you know it's tough. Um, I think the country is uh, has shown uh, a very good spirit, uh, and uh, I would say you know 95 percent of the people are really in uh, in confinement, which knowing Italians was not uh, a guaranteed thing. Uh, but I think the population have responded very well so far. Okay. Now, you're heading and managing uh, Europe's uh, buyout group for Carlyle. How is your business um, or activity in buyouts in Europe being affected, you think, um, now and uh, perhaps in the near future by the pandemic? Well, clearly we have had uh, a big hit. Uh, you know, we have right now in our portfolio called it, you know, 25 companies. So it's a fairly large uh, data set spanning across different industries. And clearly with the progressive shutdown, we have a number of businesses that are completely idle. Uh, think of retailers uh, or, or things of that sort. A couple of uh, more industrial goods, especially if they are, for example, in the food space or whatnot, uh, they are technically still running, but clearly the impact on demand is, uh, is quite dramatic. And uh, this is is something that is impacting, I would say, 99% of businesses. Uh, probably if you are in some uh, you know, sanitizing business, probably you're, you're doing okay, but it really affects everybody. Uh, in the lockdown, what uh, is pretty obvious is that the impact of the supply chain in today's world of interlocked supply chains is even very hard just to predict what the impact would be. And you have different timing of the lockdown in different parts of the world. And therefore you have the additional problem on your supply chain. So you have an issue on your demand side, and then you have issues on your supply chain. Uh, clearly today, the focus is cash and making sure that companies are able to make it through. Uh, this is really the effort. So it's not really focusing on what is going to be the PL for the next quarter? Uh, it is really to make sure that you have enough cash to make it through. And, uh, and that is really the big effort that all of the companies 
in which we are involved uh, are currently doing, uh, you know, each company is making uh, you know a number of possible scenarios. I think today, more than making a forecast, uh, it is about uh, you know looking at possible scenarios. I don't think there is anyone who is uh, in a position to make an accurate forecast given the level of uncertainties. And the two big variables is obviously the length of the shutdown and uh, you know what is your cash burn on a monthly basis for each month of shutdown, and then the shape of the recovery, uh, you know, how steep it's going to be. And in some instances, the steeper it is, the worse it is from a cash flow point of view because you have to finance your working capital. So you have to look at it both from a, you know, an absolute type of things, and clearly overall it's better if the recovery is as solid as possible, but then when you look at it at the micro level, at the company level, uh, you know, the startup is going to have a negative cash impact on your business. So it is really a cash driven type of approach, uh, which uh, is something that many management team have never experienced in their life. Uh, so I think uh, it is something that people are learning uh, by the day. Clearly, we're trying to support all of our management team as much as we can, but it's new for everybody. Um, and, uh, and that, I think, it's an experience. I mean, those scenarios are refined by the day because you collect more uh, data points uh, and uh, you also have uh, uh, the various measures that the various governments are taking in supporting companies, which is a huge help. And I do believe that that is something that all governments are, are doing it. Uh, you know, in Europe, uh, there has been an important decision, which is for the first time uh, since uh, it, uh, it, it had put in place, basically the European Union said, forget the fiscal compact, which is this rule whereby governments cannot uh, manage their deficit without an agreement with the European Union. And given the severity of the situation, that rule is, is gone. So all, com all countries are not really looking now. You don't take it, have to take it to the extreme of what the impact is going to be on their balance sheet. But uh, it's a really a short-term measure to make sure that you're able to support uh, the individuals and the companies. Because uh, if you don't do that, when, uh, when this is over, and at some point it will be over, you'll have nothing to build upon. And so I think the effort is really to make sure that people are able to make it through. Uh, you're going to make it through with the bruises. It's going to be tough, but it's important to make it through so that there is a hope for tomorrow. And what I'm seeing is also from uh, you know, on the management side, it's important to them to see, okay, this is going to be tough. We're going to have to take very difficult uh, decisions. Uh, but uh, you know there is a tomorrow, and I think it is important, both on an individual basis for a country, from a uh, that uh, without creating illusions, but to clearly see that there is a tomorrow, because if not, you get into a vicious circle, and then it can be really bad. Question, uh, Marco, that I think a lot of people are asking themselves is. Why, when you go to uh, supermarkets, uh, and this has happened in Italy, uh, it's also happening here in the United States, uh, you see empty shelves. Is it a supply problem or is it a demand problem? I think there is two, two impacts. Uh, probably in the very initial phase, people just rush to buy things because they're scared. But there's a more fundamental issue, and that is something that, at least in Italy and in, throughout Europe, people haven't thought about it. The behavioral change. I mean, if you stay home, you don't go to restaurants. Most people, especially those in the workplace, at lunch, they don't go back home. So the amount of meals that are done at home and therefore require you to buy your grocery at the supermarket has doubled or tripled. And so it's also a problem of supply. So it was not only people rushing to buy stuff because of fear, but it just they eat more at home. And that is, I think, an interesting phenomenon that people haven't thought about. Yes, thank you so much uh, for your insights, uh, Marco. Um, so I hope, uh, very much hope that uh, in uh, uh, just uh, hopefully a few weeks uh, you can enjoy Fettuccine Alfredo at your favorite uh, restaurant in, in well, Rome. Well, we, we, we're all becoming expert cooks that we are all at home. So, I mean, also talking with various friends, I mean, you know, we have, uh, you know, virtual cooking sessions and things of that sort. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us today. This was Marco De Benedetti, who is the Managing Director 
and uh, co-head uh, for Europe uh, Biot Group at Carlisle. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me.